So this is where I met Commander X. He was sitting here, cowboy hat out, and he was reading. He had a, a thick sci-fi novel, and I just recently had published my first novel, so it seemed appropriate that I dropped two dollars in there. And he looked up and he had this interesting face, craggy, and a definite story. So the, the gut reaction of the novelist is to is to engage and find out more. But little did I know that I was about to fall into the quicksand of hackers, of anonymous, and the beautiful randomness of life. You saw me reading a book? And he's like, you know, I, I wrote a book. I was like, well, you got one of your books? I came and brought him a book, and he read it. I wanted fucking stories. I didn't, reality had become a bit too much right then. And it was fucking great. It's a great book. I didn't have an idea for six weeks who this guy was. He was just a friend on the street. But then he told me that he was a cyber warlord one of the generals in Anonymous. Online hackers who identified as being part of Anonymous and other groups have carried out dozens of high-profile online operations. And that he was on the run from the FBI and had been for six years. Because I felt that the prosecution was political against myself, I chose to flee into exile, and I'm in Canada now. And there was an article that could corroborate all this, and it was in the New Yorker, and I should go home and, and, and read it. Yeah, I mean, he's polite about it. Okay, okay, cool, yeah, take a look at it tonight, but I knew from the look in his eyes. You know, he wasn't buying that meat without inspecting it. I cross-referenced the name that was in the article, Christopher Mark Doyon, and up popped his mugshot from when he was arrested for trying to sell large quantities of LSD at a Grateful Dead gig in, in Indiana. And when his face popped up, I got goosebumps. It was a life-changing moment. I, I get the same look every time I reveal myself. I could tell that he was just like, dude, dude, you really are this person. So let's bring us to today. Today? Today. Well, today they're making a fucking movie about my life. <laughs> I've been called cyber terrorist, but I have to laugh right now at the fucking very idea. What, what is an information terrorist? Please, I mean, dude, can somebody help me with that? How can I terrorize people with, with the truth? Commander X had a knack for being at the beginning of these movements, being right there. We're information activists just trying to make our world a bit freer and a little better. He is smart, he is articulate, and his words have power that most peoples do not. That's dangerous to the power elite. We fight bad guys and, and tyrants wherever we find them. He was very divisive. Some people loved him, some people hated him. He was a distraction at best, I think, of times. He would type in all caps, you know what I mean? Like, he was a guy who, who commanded attention. If there's anyone who did the most to take that edge between absurdity and awe-inspiring and just fucking ram it over to the fucking absurdity part. It was Commander X. Look, this is a war. I mean, in straight up, this is a war. I think there's like an entertainer in him. I mean, he likes to tell stories. He likes to kind of take you into a whole world. And sometimes you don't know how much of that is exaggeration. You have to put a person behind the mask. People want stories. So Commander X did make a good story. I was talking with my editor at The New Yorker about doing a larger piece about Anonymous. And to me, the story was how has activism moved from the streets to the internet and then back to the streets? That was, I think, fundamentally the story I was telling. And Commander X was, in, was really the personification of that. It was a profile of a contemporary American activist. 
He grew up in Maine, like on a ranch in Maine. But, you know, he had a difficult life. He had a difficult upbringing. His father was abusive. My parents were not very good people. I'm just going to end it there. But they were not very good people. And so I spent a lot of time at my grandmother's house. And I had become fascinated with the idea of computers. The Industrial Revolution expanded the strength of man's muscles in the reach of his hands. The Information Revolution is magnifying the power of his brain, changing forever the way Americans work, play, travel, and even think. I was always quite fascinated with the computer in Star Trek, the thing fucking talked. So I convinced this guy who worked for my dad, he was a pharmacist assistant, to bring me to the local university and show me a real fucking computer. So he brought me down to the university, sat me down, and of course I immediately sit there and I was like, hello, computer because the only knowledge I have computer is Star Trek, and it's supposed to talk, right? And he's like, no, no, it doesn't work like that. And there was a program. It was a very basic chat program. As a friggin' 13-year-old kid, you're sitting there to shink shit, kind of start talking back to you. You're like, fuck me. You know, that's, that's incredible, you know? Then I went to my grandmother and I said, I need 100 bucks. There was no way to buy a computer back then. You, it was a kit that you bought, and then they sent it to you, and you had to literally solder the fucking thing together and then plug it into a television and a, t and a cassette recorder. And the cassette recorder acted as the hard drive. And I said, Grandma, just sit down, please. I want to talk to you. I am convinced, Grandma, that these things called computers are going to change the world. And she's like, well, what does it do? I was like, you can use it as a calculator. You can balance your checkbook with it. You can play video games. She leaned back in the chair and she says, well, I'm going to spend $2 and buy you a pocket calculator. And then I'm gonna sit you down and teach you how to balance your checkbook. And then if you do all that, I'll take you out to the video game store and for 40 bucks, I'll buy you a Pong game. And you can just skip the $100 computer. I said, Grandma, you just don't understand. <laughs> this is gonna change the world. It took me about a year to put the thing together. So you can see that coming into it from that way in that fashion just the fascination's never gonna wear off. Now, I'm like a kid in the candy store. I'm living my own science fiction. I wake up every morning, I get in front of that computer. I, I am not unhappy. I spend 10, 12 hours a day in front of that thing, and I just find it all fascinating every single fucking day I get up. He gets to Cambridge. He was sleeping on park benches. My understanding of it was just because he liked the mobility of it. He claims that he was always homeless by choice. And then I went to a Grateful Dead show. <laughs> Inevitably, that was going to come into it. And it was in Boston. And I ran across an anti-apartheid protest. I stopped. I hung out with people. I smoked some pot. Um, I was given flyers and shit. You know, you make friends with people that got a flyer in their hand, you're gonna read it. I was so angry that there could be a system of government in our century, in my lifetime, that you had to go into a police station and put your hand up to a color chart, and based on how dark or light you were, that's how many rights you got. That is fucking ridiculous. <laughs> and then they're like, yeah, well, you know, Thanks for hanging out with us, and you know, we're doing this thing fucking tomorrow. They got me really good with the whole hanging out with me and smoking some weed thing because, you know, being a solitude kind of kid, anybody that felt made me feel like I was their pal, you know, they got the time of day. And, you know, of course, I had to do other things. I went to a lot of rock shows back then. I had to make a living, and I did that at rock shows. Not only am I not ashamed, but I'm somewhat proud of the fact that we sold really good LSD we would go out and do a U.S. tour with the dad, and we would raise shit tons of money. And it just gelled more is all it did. I went to more dead shows. I made more money. I went to more protests. Some dude with fucking cakey-ass dreads literally down to his knees would sidle up to me and give me maybe a little piece of paper folded up like this in the passing crowd. And it would be the next ELF action, or the next ALF action, or the next protest against anti-apartheid. That's definitely the whole texture of the cloth, and it just gets woven tighter and tighter as I become more and more sucked into this idea of just permanent resistance to all this fucked up shit. The things like the Animal Liberation Front, the Earth Liberation Front, I did my tours of duty in both of those. And then eventually our little silly little hacker group that we called the People's Liberation Front 
The PLF, we were more of like a little militia. We, we adopted these titles called commander. And we were, we'd all dress in camo when we went to protest and shit. And one day, my friend sat me down and said, uh, look, we, we want to have a talk about something. A hacktivist group by the name of Anonymous had hacked the forums of the Epilepsy Foundation of America. And they had placed on the forum on the front page a animated GIF. These GIFs, these animated GIFs, they strobe very brightly, they strobe very fast. They could take an epileptic and cause them to have a seizure just from looking at it. Four people went to the hospital across the country. And these people were literally harmed by hackers thousands of miles away, physically wounded. It sounds so funny on one level. I get the lulls. I get why they did it. They're still fucking dickheads. If you're out there today watching this movie, you're a piece of shit. He was a deadhead. Here's a guy who would like anti-apartheid protesters. He got busted supposedly for selling 300 hits of acid at dead shows. I mean, this is what he's coming out of. So this idea that these, these punks were trying to hurt people was upsetting. So he didn't have a great opinion of this um, anonymous, whatever it was. We can't let that fucking pass. These people need to either be brought to justice or at the very least fucking monitored to see what else they're gonna fucking do. So I was tasked with literally infiltrating anonymous. I was to go in the IRC, spend as much time as I could, make as much contacts, not to get these people busted. This was not some sort of law enforcement thing. I just wanna know what these fucking people are up to, you know? So that's how I get into anonymous. There was no founder of Anonymous. From late 2007 on, there was some degree of soft power that, in one way or another, managed to corral this phenomenon and did so in ways that were effective, that allowed it to become a decisive force, sometimes in the history of nations. There was no reason to expect that that would last without a charter, without a structure. There was no reason to expect this would go on for too long. It is, frankly, shocking in retrospect that it worked for as long as it did. My name is Barrett Brown. I'm a journalist, an activist, and a gentleman adventurer. Anonymous was not founded, and I'm not sure if anybody would have taken responsibility for it had they actually founded it back in the 4chan days. The 4chan website, the image board, that have been around since you know, 2004, 2005, the primordial soup from which Anonymous eventually evolved. That was the crucible for Anonymous, so I don't think you can really understand Anonymous without understanding 4chan. There were message boards within 4chan. It was a forum for people on the internet to talk freely and openly about a variety of subjects. Then there was a board that was just the random board, slash B, where you could talk about anything. That's where it became a bit more free form. And the idea was that your default handle was Anonymous. That was the name you were given. It was kind of like this hive mind of the internet. And so they started to do what they called raids, which was sort of like, hey, let's do like a little field trip on the internet, it's something fun and stupid. So they did, the, well, one of the famous ones was Have a Hotel, which was this children's game, which they decided to infiltrate, you know, have all these characters with afros. I think there was some like Nazi imagery. It was just about shock value and fun. Um, obviously offensive fun. I participated in some of these things, like some of this, this Second Life raids where they would don these bizarre garish outfits and go around and wave giant penises like at concerts they were having in Second Life and, other, and uh, uh, bomb furry nightclubs. I remember thinking like the, the sort of the emergent organization that's going on here. This is a new dynamic that the internet has made possible. In a world where there's no more pioneer land, there's no more frontier, suddenly it was all frontier in every direction. I wondered, you know, what would happen when these people realize what power they have and what greater power they could have if they were to adopt some shared ideology, some shared enemy even. And that ended up happening. Everyone knows that Anonymous existed, depending on how you look at it, all the way back to even late 03. But in reality, that was two people on a website, you know? The strangest thing happens, you know, in January 08, it becomes this, you know, giant movement that the news is covering. And uh, that was partially my fault. 
uh, and definitely an accident. You know, I look back and I wish I could say, you know, I masterminded this amazing thing on purpose. No, I, I have no idea what I was doing, dude. On January 14th, 2008, up on 4chan, this video is posted of Tom Cruise being insane. Tom Cruise, Scientologist. Being a Scientologist, when you drive past an accident, it's not like anyone else. As you drive past, you know you have to do something about it because you know you're the only one that can really help. And another post comes saying the video is gone. And everyone's like, well, wait, why did, why did that get taken down? That's Tom Cruise being insane. It's, it's fucking funny. We decided that we're really good at doxing people. We're really good at getting their information and hunting people down and uh, use some connections to find the person who had the video. And by we, I mean uh, a few of us who were on IRC, uh, which is a chat system, we went and found the person who had uploaded that video and got their source and uh, we re-uploaded it. <laughs> it was taken offline in like 30 seconds. Scientology at that point was watching YouTube for everything going by and like, got it again. And uh, that actually pissed us off. You just don't do that. You don't take something off the internet. I remember talking to someone about this and they equated to like a, a, like a playground <laughs> and somebody took their ball. We have fair use laws uh, under the DMCA, but YouTube was still caving because they didn't want to fight a billion dollar behemoth like, uh, you know, Scientology. The Church of Scientology had a long history ever since the internet became a thing of trying to control it, trying to censor uh, materials uh, from the church that they consider to be proprietary, uh, generally things that are embarrassing regarding their beliefs. So we decided we were going to troll Scientology by putting out a press release. Hello, leaders of Scientology. We are anonymous. Over the years, we have been watching you, your campaigns of misinformation, your suppression of dissent, your litigious nature. It skirted the line between goofy and uh, awe-inspiring. It happens to successfully fear towards awe-inspiring. Anonymous has therefore decided that your organization should be destroyed. This is ominous. Like, we're writing like, the internet is coming for you, get ready. We shall proceed to expel you from the internet and systematically dismantle the Church of Scientology in its present form. Anonymous promised an army would come and defeat Scientology, would come and, and bring just unprecedented chaos. It was about 10.20 at night on the 21st of January, 2008. I don't remember my birthday half the time. I don't know why this one sticks so well, but that we uploaded this video. And uh, I think if I'm lucky, 20, 30 people watch this video, find it funny. We are anonymous. We are legion. We do not forgive. We do not forget. Expect us. I got woken up by my girlfriend at the time. It was like 4.30 in the morning. She's calling me, maybe five is right around there. And she says, turn on CNN. And, and, and I turned on CNN and the video's on CNN. And I'm like, what is going on? You have nowhere to hide because we are everywhere. And at that point, we're sitting there with a million views on the video, news reaching out, trying to get a hold of us, Scientology paying big money to private eyes, trying to find us, and an army kind of in front of us that are all going by the name Anonymous now. They promised an army, they didn't have it, but by virtue of making it clear, making it palpable, People wanted this army that would emerge from the internet and right wrongs. And so naively, we're like, well, then let's plan a global worldwide protest in every you know, major country on the planet. We're gonna be those old school protest types, but do it like the internet does it, so make it fun. We're sending anonymous outside, so they better remain anonymous. So we're gonna need to cover our faces. The media needs something they can show that's the ominous thing, right? So we had to give them a mask. It had to be available. So we actually spent the next about 25 hours calling comic shops, costume shops, and literally every single city we tried to call had Guy Fox masks in stock, sitting in back that no one was buying, that they had discounted because everyone thought after the V for Vendetta movie that a million of these would sell and none did. And we're like, well, great, decision made. It's the only mask we can actually use. Everyone wants a romantic version of this story. No, it was because it was the only one that was available in every single town we were gonna be in. It was ominous. It sort of created this um, mythology of Anonymous. Who is Anonymous? What are they? They wear these masks, you know? And I think that was the time when Anonymous was really branded. 
And so having conceived of the army and presented the picture, the army came. They happened to be clever enough to organize all of these thousands of people who saw this video they made. And so the army was materialized. The army showed up. This is what the internet would look like if it went outside. There were women, there were people of color, every race, there were young and old, there was everyone. And we just weren't expecting that. We were really expecting the young hackerish 4 chainer guys to all show up and that to be our little group of 20 that stood on the corner for an hour. And instead, all these other people showed up and it was great. And that's how Anonymous first became a decisive force. We have a thing now, what do we do with this? It had only been built for fighting Scientology. In reality, its whole goal was actually just to screw with them for a week. You know, again, this being so off the cuff and so completely accidental every step of it, we didn't expect this to keep going. The Scientology protests at that time it was funny as hell. And that's what eventually sold me on them. They really were turned out to be people that were authentic. So I'm hanging out with these people, and like I said, the vast majority of them, I have to admit, were good people. At that point in the story, there's just one of those cathartic moments that's about to happen for really everybody. And that was the release of the collateral murder video. that was an immediate thunderstorm of persecution fired off at WikiLeaks. WikiLeaks uh, picked a fight with the U.S. Now the U.S. is fighting back in more ways than one. American lawmakers want to see founder Julian Assange. They want to see him tried under the Espionage Act. And the WikiLeaks website has its own trouble. This is a new news here. PayPal has announced it has suspended WikiLeaks' account, costing it a vital source of funding. MasterCard, Visa, and PayPal agreed to a, a behind-the-scenes U.S. embargo against WikiLeaks, whereby they all simultaneously, more or less, said, oh, we're not going to process donations to WikiLeaks anymore. Immediately, there is this fucking visceral rage because websites like the KKK or the Westboro Baptist Church have PayPal donation links on their fucking sites. But then, what? But what? A publishing company like WikiLeaks just trying to get enough money to pay for their servers? And no? Are you kidding me? And so Anonymous just left that day, the day the donation portals came down. Anonymous said, we're coming for you. Supporters of the website WikiLeaks launching a sweeping cyber war this week. That's right, it's being called Operation Payback or also Operation Avenge Assange. And it's basically a loose affiliation of hackers that call themselves anonymous. This time they're turning attention to what they uh, consider to be the enemies of WikiLeaks. Visa, MasterCards are the big hits they've had so far. This man calls himself Commander X and says he's part of Anonymous. The power of Anonymous is, is, is that we have the ability to affect change on the internet. Their method of choice, a denial of service attack where hackers overwhelm websites with a huge volume of requests for information, crashing the site, says Commander X, for a cause. That process is, is the equivalent of a virtual sit-in. I can best sum up my philosophy with the quote that I'm so famous for and is, I admit, very fucking funny. Uh, you only need two things in this world to be a world-class hacker, a computer and a cool pair of sunglasses. And the computer's optional. You have a site on, online, all of a sudden, we snap our fingers and that site is gone. Anybody can do it. You don't have to be a hacker to take down a website. You know, you can download a program and figure it out in an afternoon. These are all various DDoS weapons. This would be the equivalent of a, of a rifle. And so now our target has been loaded. And as we say in anonymous, poo, poo, poo. And hopefully hundreds, if maybe thousands of people would download this same software and all of us fire. So it's really about multiplication. This is a weapon that's designed to be used by an army 
And we just kept going. It was an incredible time because that entire 10 days, you don't even sleep. You have, in essence, Julian Assange, who has become a cyber messiah and hundreds of followers who are waking up zombie computers, their soldiers, and attacking companies like Visa, MasterCard. And this is the first time you really begin to hear during those 10 days, the FBI rhetoric was just over the top. You know, these are cyber terrorists. Uh, we're gonna shut them down. And of course, we're all like, yeah, fuck you. Yeah, so what? It's protest, motherfuckers, get used to it. In the midst of that, I've been living in Santa Cruz, and I had a cabin up in the mountains, but I used to stay, and when I was in Santa Cruz, I didn't pay for a hotel. There's places to sleep outdoors. Santa Cruz doesn't just have homeless people. Um, you have, like, you're mentally ill and you're uh, addicted who hover around Santa Cruz because there's a lot of drugs there. It's a surf town. But the vast majority of people that they label homeless people are actually just bohemes. They're just people traveling up and down the coast. It's a travel corridor for backpacking, camper living culture that exists in California. make it illegal for a man to fall asleep on the fucking grass and give him a ticket and even put him in fucking jail. And when, and when that doesn't pass muster in court, you make a law against people covering up with a blanket at night when they're asleep. Literally, they got a blanket law in Santa Cruz. I'm not even shitting you. These homeless people had a protest camp going called Peace Camp. We were sleeping on the courthouse steps. We're sleeping in protest. We're sleeping literally with a sign next to us that said, I am protesting the sleep law. That's why I'm sleeping here. There's people sleeping all over this fucking courthouse. What's going on here? It's Peace Camp 2010. So the camp has grown from an overnight sleep in to a 24 hour hangout. Woohoo! We're stars, man. Peace Camp 2010. They can't get enough of us. We are the media darlings. I'm Matt Dinesher at the Santa Cruz County Courthouse, where homeless activists have been protesting city ordinances for more than a month. We have a squad of sheriffs on hand. The Santa Cruz Police Department despised all of us, professional protesters. I'm just gonna find you sleeping here illegally. You will county property as soon as possible, okay? I'm here illegally. Here's a written notice for you. These people are not guilty because there's no public shelter. And attention began to grow in Santa Cruz very, very big time. Get rid of the uncomfortables. Looks like they're going to arrest us. And I'd been arrested. Hey, Chris, you have a warrant out for your arrest. I'm going to go ahead and place your hands behind your back. Just okay. go ahead and set those down. Nobody had any clue that this scraggly guy with a long red beard and everything is like one of the most notorious hackers online. With a name... Commander X. I uh, decided that I would harness my new friends <laughs> that I was garnering in the Anonymous Collective. And I said, I got a plan. I said, I, I think I, I want to take down the county website. I said, but I want to be super cool about it because I, I, I'm here in this fucking town. So what I'd like to do is do it really ethical hacking style. Let's do it at, on a Sunday at noon for 30 minutes and we'll pre-announce it, we'll tell them the specific time it is going to be down so that, you know, the public will know that you just, just wait, you know, and it will come back. I just went off and did it. I sat in a fucking coffee house and I'm churning out these attacks. I'm deploying cyber weapons that our crew built just to DDoS shit. Two detectives from Santa Cruz Sheriff's walked in and gave everybody a good fucking look over. And that's when I started packing up to get the fuck out of there. Oh my God, my fucking heart is coming out of my chest. A sweat pouring off me. I got my pack on my back, my laptop over my shoulder, and I just fucking scoot left and walk normal as you can. But anyway, I make my way to the library, put out the press release from the library. And then the next morning I get up and the headline is on the Santa Cruz paper. I mean, in big black letters. Santa Cruz cyber attack. And I knew, I knew, I just knew it was epic. And I knew that my life would never be the same again. And the other thing I also knew was that Anonymous was the most powerful force ever to be created in humanity so far.
and that no doubt they were fucking coming for us and coming for us with guns drawn, literally. Cyber is the battlefield of the future. And most of these attackers are going after whatever the hell they can in order to show you what they can do. And that is very hard, very frankly, to defend against. I'm uh, Leon Panetta, former uh, director of the CIA, former secretary of defense, and uh, now uh, chairman of the Panetta Institute for Public Policy. Power can be very infatuating when you know you have power and you can exercise that power. And I think in many ways that's what happened with a group like Anonymous and other hacking groups that suddenly realized they had their hands on a very powerful weapon and they weren't quite sure. And I think they still remain not quite sure about just exactly what it means. You know, for something like the CIA and for other intelligence agencies, at least you know uh, the devil that you're after. But when it comes to anonymous hackers, it was much more difficult to try to figure out what are they after? What damage could they do? Are these just a bunch of people, you know, playing 21st century hacking games? <laughs> or are these people that have a motivation that could be very dangerous to our security? I was fucking Batman. And I had powers. By then, I was like gearing up. I'm geeking up. I'm starting to fucking bust some shit. I'm starting to fucking have some fun with this. Because I was working very hard by that point. I was putting in 10, 12, 15 hour days to this movement of anonymous. I was participating to the fullest extent that I could do and not die. Commander X is who he is, and you know, we all know, we've all seen his, his version of uh, reality. But um, he didn't come into my orbit until people started talking to me about the fact that X said he talked to you on IRC, and I'm like, who? He just kind of showed up as a guy who was putting up websites under the Anon name, and you'd look at it, and the website looked like it was built in 1993, like one of the first drafts of a website ever, that a guy who was openly telling us he was homeless was building, so like, he didn't want to just outright say, uh, what the fuck guy, you wanted to say, okay, guy's trying with very limited resources. He would be, you know, we doing his thing, and obviously he was doing DDoSing, he was hitting targets, he was... I didn't think he was doing too much harm, and I was always kind to him because, uh, surprisingly enough, I am actually innately a kind person by default. That I just said like nice things, and sometimes like a sarcastic, like "Go forth, continue, Commander." As I understand his story, he was the kind of hippie protester who showed up and you know was holding signs anti-war and all that, you know. And that was none of us. To, to speak the honest truth, like I'm the 19 year old driving a car who sees a puddle and a bunch of people at a bus stop and hits the puddle as fast as he can. I, that's me at 19, I'm, I'm not the good guy. So from the very beginning, there was definitely a clash of just personalities because he came at it from a completely different way. We sort of were thrust into being activists very accidentally and that was just who he thought he was. I did not have all access at that point to Anonymous. I was, you know, definitely very strong and very powerful person and had to respect even the people like Barrett Brown and, and Greg House and stuff like that. And I remember clearly going to Barrett Brown and asking him, what do you think we should do next? I think he responded with just one word, keep an eye on the Middle East. Commander X and I did not sit there and plan the advent of Optunisia and the Tunisian Revolution. The Tunisian Revolution began when a fruit vendor in Tunis, the capital, set himself on fire in protest of uh, the local corrupt police having taken away uh, his uh, assets for failure to, failure to pay a bribe. That is what sparked the initial conflagration. That's what started the, the street uprisings, the, the rage. It, it provided an enzyme, or sorry, a catalyst, rather. I'm not good with chemistry or much else provided a catalyst, a center of, of attention for those in the country who are aware of it to uh, rally around. Tunisia is, is one of those interesting ones where they invited us in. We didn't even come and talk to them. They came and talked to us, you know? At first, we all didn't think we could help. I mean, honestly, strange enough, Commander X was the first one on that channel saying, no, we can absolutely do this. And we all thought he was 
fucking insane. I mean, like, who, who the hell are we? This is a dictator of an African nation. Some Tunisian hackers came to us in Anonymous, and in fact, they were more or less handed off to me because nobody knew quite what to do with them. But they claimed to have some rather extraordinary access, but needed some assistance. Um, it's a small country with a small infrastructure, and we have the usernames and passwords to everything. You name it. The water supply, like the radio stations, the servers that the president's email is on. You don't have to hack anything. We just have the passwords. Here you go. So we were able to prove that these people were receiving just enormous bribes, living like gods, while Tunisia drowned in poverty. And so now these people are, are, are really just fucking furious. Is this right? Who are the people who are planning on going to the streets? Are they, are they our people? You know, are, are, are we helping some extremists who are gonna make it worse? So we did a lot of work with these guys and we did uh, honestly like days of research into who the president was, Ben Ali, who he was, you know, the dictator, uh, you know. Turns out the people who were going to the streets were really the people, and uh, they needed to overthrow this, this dictator. To the extent there is right and wrong, and that one can point to a large group of people and say that one is mostly right, that one is mostly wrong, there was never any question that we were right, and that if, if this was to escalate further, it would be a terrible thing for living involved, but I would personally uh, be enthusiastic about that. I mean, you look at it and you think, what could hackers do? But you'd be surprised at how important it is to keep communication from city to city. We built this list of all the technologies they would block, and we kind of estimated what order they would try and block them in. Like, easiest, they're going to just get Twitter and Facebook turned off in the country, right? So we put proxies up and fed them to all the people in the major cities uh, as as soon as the, these start working, access them this way. Can we get activated satellite phones to some of the people in these towns? Yes, we can. It keeps going from there to like seven layers of communication. So when the internet goes down, then when the cell phones go down, we can keep handing them a new way to keep in contact. This is all unraveling in hours and days. It's breakneck speed. I fought, as we talked about earlier in the apartheid movement, for 10 fucking years. It took 10 days to run the dictator out of Tunisia. What can we say? After Tunisia, we're starting to help the Egyptians with the same tools, because now we've kind of got a toolkit. We're really beginning to define skill sets that specifically apply to these street revolutions. One of the things we had done there was we knew the internet was gonna get cut pretty easily. So our preparedness for that was we had gotten dial-up ISPs, old school 90s level modems, mailed in to Egypt. So if the internet got completely cut but the phones were still working, they could dial into the internet. We turned the internet back on in Egypt three times. So the Egyptians were using the internet to organize what would become the Arab Spring. Oh my God, we are having geopolitical impact. We're saying who's gonna fucking rule in this world and who isn't. None of these were our protests when you look at any of the stuff we did during the Arab Spring. None of them were our ideas. This is a revolution for the sincere people of this country. They're the ones that want to make the change. They're the ones that will make the change. They're the true heroes of this country. People showed up, asked for our help, Turned out it was things we could do, so we did it. And then I went back to building uh, some plumber's website the next day. I mean, I think we came out of the era of spring pretty convinced we were all fucking gods. Commander X is, is definitely a victim of his own ego at this point. Was Commander X on the ground in, in uh, the square in Tunis, in the capital, uh, getting shot at? No, there were people on the ground risking their lives. <laughs> They could have possibly done this without us. We could not have done it without them. By the time the Tunisian Revolution was over, by the time Egypt had started, the FBI raided 40 U.S. households on a single day in late January 2011. Over these DDoS attacks that slowed down MasterCard's corporate website, 
uh, and visas and PayPal's for a couple seconds. Armed raids with families being held at gunpoint in some cases. They were gunning for us. This is like fucking war. Dozens of FBI agents targeted alleged members of the loose-knit hacking group. Armed with search warrants, agents hit six homes in New York along with locations across the country, seizing hard drives and computer accessories. It's all at the same moment, literally the same fucking moment. That's how they do this shit. So that we can't get on like IRC and say, hey dudes, they're coming, fucking wipe your drives and run. And that's, so that's what they did, except there's only got 39 of them. <laughs> because one, was Batman. The reaction that they had was so knee-jerk to our attacks on PayPal, MasterCard, and Visa. Visa.com went offline for a few minutes. Did that affect anyone's ability to buy anything or give anyone's info away? No, it did nothing. Their marketing piece where you could download a brochure was offline for a few minutes. Somehow, $50 million in damage. No, dude, no. When have you, as someone who has a Visa card, ever gone to Visa.com? It didn't affect anyone. Uh, and it was down for five minutes, but they tried to get people, you know, to go to prison for it. MasterCard's website was offline for a couple hours, but again, that was their fault. Their, their shit was really badly built. Um, but again, very clearly, nobody uses those sites to do their transactions. Those sites are advertising. You know, what does it take to get a case indicted these days? A couple mil in Bitcoin and extortions and things like that. Whereas, you know, what did it take a case to get indicted in 2010? The low orbit ion cannon? By nature, it's a joke. Like the thing says pew pew on it. It's, a, it's by nature, it's a joke. And you know, a joke will get you prison in 2010. My name's Jay Lederman, I'm a criminal defense attorney. I do a lot of underdog work. I do a lot of um, stuff that people won't touch because they're worried it's a too high or too clandestine a level that men in, you know, black escalades are going to pull up and what have you. And that shit doesn't happen. That, 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 come on. Don't tell them that, though, because then I, I miss out on all my fun. I sent out a series of tweets that I would uh, represent some righteous hacktivist busted in my hood meaning California. So in our general mailbox, the next day there was a message from them. It said, I'm Commander X, and you know, I am the Commander X, not just Commander X, I am the Commander X. And um, he thought they were looking for him for the potential Santa Cruz DDoS. They consider that unauthorized access. And he thought that things were going down very quickly were going to be going down very quickly for him. I was in Mountain View, California. And I had known that they had pretty much tracked me to Mountain View. I was seeing the Crown Vicks around. I saw the FBI agents in the library when I was surfing on the internet. They would have had me surrounded by at least a dozen agents at all times. They must have really, really feared me at that, at that point to deploy a dozen agents rather than just walk up and fucking arrest me. I'm going back and forth with X. You know, we had the meeting spot arranged. At that point, I'm still using like some sort of commercial-based email. I'm still new. And he was using some encrypted form of email. For some reason, he said to me, the last email he said to me was like, Jay, I'll see you at uh, 10 o'clock at the such and such coffee house. And I, I said to him, why on earth did you say that? He had told me the name of the place weeks before. I had it, I had it written down, I knew where I was going. There's a guy in Bermuda shorts and that stupid Hawaiian shirt that they always make FBI agents wear thinking that that's somehow fucking stealthy and he's staring right fucking at me as I'm walking down the street. So I'm like, okay, so it's a game, right? So I'll play the game. I go to the coffee house. Another FBI agent comes in, sits down, takes my fucking picture with his cell phone. And I was like, okay, let's see if you know about the secret fucking passageway out of this fucking coffee house, because I did. Down the fucking stairs I went, out the fucking back door. Nadia, the fucking uh, fib from hell, she was screaming because she fucking saw me bolting down this alley and couldn't get out of traffic in time to come after me. 
ended up coming up the fucking sidewalk with pedestrians literally weeping out of this woman's way as she drives up the fucking sidewalk. And I was just sat down in a bus stop. I lit a cigarette. And a, a, an FBI agent who I've come to call a cyber crime guy got out of the van, calmed Nadia the fib down, made her put her gun away, and just calmly sat there with me and waited while I finished my cigarette. He asked me my name, and I said, dude, if you don't know who you're about to arrest, you're not doing the job right. Right then, Jay Lederman drove by. <laughs> I was looking for parking, and I got a call from my office that Christopher Doyon was on. Yeah, I called back the number, and it was an FBI agent, and they were like, yeah, hold on, he wants to talk to you. They got him an hour before I got there at the place we had arranged to meet. I don't know what their methods are. Who knows if they had like some camera planted in the little, whatever tree X was like, you know, sleeping under, you know, looking at his computer when he's typing it. You know, I can't prove that it was on my end, but it sure appears that the FBI violated attorney-client privilege by having my emails monitored and were able to pick him up an hour before I arrived at the meeting. At that point, I went through a couple of days of, of uh, court hearings to determine exactly what the fuck they were going to do with me. They were alleging $6,200 in damages. They did what they could to make sure it was over $5,000 because that's what they were told by the United States Attorney's Office. How do I know that, even though I don't know that? Because that's what every United States Attorney's Office tells everyone about it. They say, listen, you gotta get this over $5,000 or this is a misdemeanor. This is just some guy in a library like clicking enter on his computer. Come on, man. It's like, what, what's this worth? And then and, and that's what ultimately happened with PayPal. It was, you know, be good for 18 months and, and we'll dismiss all of these. Of course, he could have gotten 15 years. So I was released on bail. It's a mistake tactically on their part, you had me, and you let me go. And so of course I went back to the fucking war. <laughs> I'd like to state for the public record that this press conference is being held against the advice of my legal counsel. X is good at giving attorneys ulcers. Me, I, I, I'm ulcer proof, I, I work fine. This document alleges that I am the notorious hacker activist known to the world as Commander X. I am Commander X. Well, I don't know. You try to tell him to shut up. See how that works. The indictment further alleges that I am in association with the global internet freedom movement known as Anonymous. And I say yes. I am immensely proud humbled to the core to be a part of the idea called anonymous. He does have the right to remain silent. He chooses not to exercise it. You know, I am a homeless guy. And I'm scary smart. And despite the best efforts of the city, the county, and now the federal governments, I will not be silenced. The FBI is now in possession of three of my computers, two fucking cell phones, and God knows how many fucking external drives. They've taken all my electronics. They've forbidden me from using electronics. Well, how am I going to handle this? I can't go back to hacking, but I want to keep fighting and keep fucking with them. And it dawned on me what I was going to do. I'm going to say goodbye, and I'm not coming back. And I began my run to the Canadian border. As far as I knew, I think he was like sort of the first fugitive out of this whole movement. I never really believed that he was in Canada because it seemed too obvious. You know, it's like hiding in plain sight being in Canada. Like, I really didn't think he had gone to Canada. And sure as heck, he went to Canada. If you want to call me a terrorist, I've got no problem with that. Um, but I would ask you, who is it that's terrified? And if it's the bad guys that are terrified, um, 
I'm, I'm really super okay with that. The media, for some reason, loved talking to and about Commander X. I, I, for the life of me, never got it, but I also didn't think I had to. Like, the things he was saying in the media, while well, sometimes they were crazy, most of the times they were just our talking points. I went to go see him up in Montreal. Whenever you heard interviews with somebody in an anonymous, they treated it like, you know, you were just, you were some, like, troll that had run out of a cave and you're all pixelated and all of that. But, like, here was a guy who kind of looks like an older hippie guy, and that put a face on something that had been faceless to a lot of people. But I think it was in that moment, too, when he really became even more ostracized within the subculture of Anonymous, because the one thing you weren't supposed to do was to distinguish yourself, really, as an individual and put a face on something that's faceless. A lot of accusations have been levied at him about what literally is referred to as fame whoring. And they're not entirely wrong. I mean, he obviously wanted it. He literally named himself Commander. His own version of the story, you know, very much says that he came in and was, you know, helping to make things better and... Um... There were certainly people who just felt that Commander X didn't deserve to have a feature in The New Yorker about him. It was that line in The New Yorker, but I forgot who said it, but it was like, you know, I really got sick of Commander X when he started comparing himself to Batman. That is a line that if it is said about you, it is written about, if it is something that everyone agrees with, if, if it could be uttered in, in, in truth, uh, should be enough. But let me go further. He was an albatross. He was an anchor, an anchor on all of our necks. He would claim that like actions were being taken that weren't being taken uh, at levels that just we weren't working at at that time. His alias is Commander X, and in some recent interviews, he's made some startling claims. He says that Anonymous may very well be the most powerful organization on Earth, and that the group of 50,000 members worldwide have access to every classified database in the U.S. government. People would then be like, why did he say that? I mean, that just sounds stupid. Like, we could bring small children in here, and like, we could tell them, oh, we have access to every classified data, and like, a five or six-year-old would suddenly work that out and be like, well, how do you know, first of all, that you have all of them, and second of all, uh, you know, why would you say that out loud if you really did? Wouldn't that uh, be a bad security breach? Talk a little bit more about that. Well, I have nothing more to say. What do you want to know? It was getting to people because he was also making the message look bad. Like, he says this that's obviously insane, then another Anon says something that's obviously true, but they're all insane. Several weeks ago, I began research and experimentation on the development of a software program and kit that when downloaded and installed would allow the user to conduct true time travel, essentially turning their home computer into a time machine. This is literally a fucking email he wrote in 2009. I was taking a break from reading up on the theory behind psionic time travel, and I was sitting under a tree. That's a, sitting under a tree, that's obnoxious. I was wondering idly if I would ever crack the theory of time travel. How could you even wonder that? At that moment, myself from approximately 25 years in the future came strolling down High Street. The me from the future, less than 10 feet away, turned and actually smirked at me. I guess my time travel software kit works. That's Commander X. That guy was, was getting, was, was among those people who, when I was not able to formulate the message in the background or the foreground with the press, it was him. And it was increasingly him. And then when I went to prison, it was very much him. The FBI raided me on March 6th, 2012. Uh, raided my apartments first. Found I wasn't there, uh, which was by design. Uh, then raided my mom's house and uh, took my electronics, computers, phones, uh, files, just like they had taken files and papers from my place. And then six months later, uh, after I had learned, I had been told by the prosecutor that they were going to be charging my mom as well, which is a very common practice among the FBI, charging someone's female loved ones to get them to cooperate, uh, and knowing uh, myself that I would never cooperate with the FBI. I made several videos laying all this out. Hi, <laughs> I'm Barrett Brown again. This is part three of a three-part series on why I'm angry with the FBI. <laughs> Sorry. I've got a case of the giggles. Uh, my mom has not been involved in any of this at all. Was not, just not, did not know about the tip I received the previous day. Didn't know I was over there. I come over there a lot. Uh, didn't know why I brought, you know, the laptops over. 
you know, didn't notice, didn't pay attention. I also threatened to uh, shoot anybody or more FBI agents came to my house. They know that I'm armed, that I come from a military family, that I was taught to shoot by a Vietnam vet and by my father, a master hunter, and uh, I will shoot all of them and kill them. It was pretty obvious I was going to be dead before I was 40 or so, so I wouldn't mind going out with two FBI sidearms like a fucking Egyptian pharaoh. And so I was ready. It's like super passionate about this argument. <laughs> Oh, is Barry getting fucking ready by the FBI? Holy shit! Oh. A few months later, I was uh, charged, this time with 11 counts of aggravated identity theft. The charges in this case, to justify it, involved me copying and pasting a link from an anonymous IRC chat room. Then a month later after that, after those charges, I was charged once more for obstruction of justice, just like my mom was, for hiding laptops uh, in her kitchen cabinet. So, long story short, I went to prison. If America is supposed to be the bastion of liberty around the world, how do I even end up here in Mexico? How does shit like this even happen? The Computer Fraud and Abuse Act is one of the worst punished statutes out there in that the amount of time you can get in relation to the harm caused is astounding. Yeah, okay, I'm a criminal. What I face now is 12 years in prison. This is hanging over his head, as does an absconding charge now. So now on top of the 12 is added another seven. So we're now talking about 19 years, and I, in prison, do not have that long to live. So it's a life sentence. And for me, that's the line in the sand. I actually first went to Toronto because of the world premiere of a documentary called We Are Legion. Introduce yourself. <laughs> um, all right. I first met X at a um, at an Occupy protest in in Oakland at the height of the Occupy movement, and at that point he was homeless. He was, uh, he, I mean, he's clearly living on the streets. He was attracted to the movement because of uh, its activist potential. I have stood upon the mountaintop known as Anonymous and look down on a, a, a world inflamed with revolution. You know, I saw him again when he was homeless in Toronto, and he was, you know, Toronto is not an easy place to be homeless. And, uh, you know, he wasn't doing well. He wasn't doing well. No country should be allowed to stifle the sense to a point where people are committing suicide and people are fleeing their own country, never to return. I mean, think about the decision I made. I'm never going home. Something about the city made me feel like it would be a very awesome place for me to take a bit of a break and maybe blend in. You know, I'll settle here. Seems all right. And so I met Ian Thornton when he was just walking down the street. As a recently turned storyteller, this was gold dust. I mean, it wasn't, there was no master plan to do anything with it, but viscerally, this is the sort of thing that a storyteller dreams of. Truth being weirder than fiction, this had to be investigated. Almost every person who I've ever revealed myself to while I was on the run all said the same thing. Why did you tell me? Why would you do something that stupid? And Ian, too, asked me, why would you do that? And it's simply because I needed the help. So this, for several years, was the bedroom of Commander X. And quite uncannily, someone has been using it as a bedroom. He slept with his laptop underneath his head. He would wrap it in bubble wrap, particularly during the winter, make it watertight. And then if he were disturbed during the night, at least his laptop was under his head. And he'd get up every morning, he'd go to the, to the coffee shop, and that's where he'd start his electronic warfare and mischief and intrigue. He helped me write the books because I didn't have an agent. I didn't have a lawyer. I didn't have a publisher. 
you know, he gave me safe houses whenever I needed them, hotel rooms, Airbnbs. He had a cottage out by the lake. He knew what my goals were, which was to find asylum. We went through some incredible experiences where we really thought I was going to Iceland for a minute. And then it didn't pan out. Well, we thought for a moment, quite seriously, I might be going to Russia. And that didn't pan out. USA! USA! Thank you. USA! USA! Thank you very much, everybody. And then Trump got elected. Sorry to keep you waiting, complicated business. Donald Trump had already made himself a, a rabid enemy of the Mexican people and the Mexican government. We will build a great wall along the southern border. And Mexico will pay for the wall. You can use my walls. We will never pay for that fucking wall. Trump had really ratcheted up the, 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 the tension between the two countries. And when you're looking for asylum, this is what you're looking for. It's a political hack. You're essentially looking to pit two nation states against each other for the sole purpose of creating a tiny bubble of freedom for yourself. So Mexico is looking really in play here. The big problem, of course, is geography, right? I've got to go back into the United States of America. And do I really want to go back from being a political dissident in exile in Canada to being a fugitive, both boots on the ground? And so I produced a 30-page PDF and called Ian to the coffee house. I said, so what do you think? And he said, you're not going to actually do this, right? And I was like, yeah, I think I'm going to do it. I said, well, I want to help. And so that was born Operation Golden Eagle. Golden Eagle, for those not maybe up to speed, is the National Bird of Mexico. We made a nice code name. I secretly contacted Barrett Brown, and I said, do you want to come with me, dude? You want to get out? When I won't go to Mexico with you, when I'm, you know, to leave a, a country that I have uh, increasingly come to despise, it means I don't like you and don't think much of your planning ability. And his decision was no. How many times you have to flee the country? I just want to do it once. Anonymous Operation Golden Eagle is by far the weirdest human endeavor probably in human history so far. It was the most elaborate thoughtful, anonymous operation that I have ever been a part of. 100 kilometers to Alatuna begins now. This is a southeastern Manitoba, Canada. We knew it was hunting season in Manitoba. We knew if I was going to go through the woods in Manitoba, I might get shot at. And I did. One has to fucking wonder how a hacker from Cambridge ends up in a place like this. And out of Altoona, I will break back into my own country. And guess what? This is our first camp in the United States of America. Because that, folks, that's North Dakota. I'm now, by my own choice, a full-on fugitive. Wanted dead or alive. How do you like them apples? I'm actually taking a cab right out of Pembina. <laughs> Oh, uh, straight to Grand Forks. From Grand Forks, I'm catching a Greyhound all the way to El Paso. <laughs> all the way to what we call in this operation the exit node, which is El Paso. That's El Paso is the city that I'll stage my exit out of America. If something's going to go wrong, it's going to go wrong on these 15 kilometers where some cop jacks me up way the fuck out here because I can't explain what the fuck I'm doing out here. Bullet casings. People are out here shooting. And if I don't make it, or if I'm killed by bandits, or if I'm captured by the United States authorities in the last one and a half kilometers to the border, I want you to know I did my best, but hopefully I make it.
I have no idea. I have very little idea what's in here. I had this laptop when he switched for a newer one, a more lightweight one, for his trip. He wanted to be far more streamlined, and, uh, and this was the stuff that he left. Oh, jeez, look at this. This is World War I stuff. When I hugged him at the Greyhound station in September 2017, I didn't think I was going to see him ever again. But I will be surprising him in Mexico City on Guy Fawkes Day. People in the anonymous collective have learned to watch my Twitter very carefully. And so I, I, I began to tease, hey guys, watch me on November 5th. Because I didn't want to just announce I'm going to be at the monument ahead of time. I'm going to do something really cool, guys. Keep an eye out. I have hundreds and hundreds of journalists who follow my Twitter account just for that reason. Well, we're on our way to the Million Mask March in Mexico City just to remind the people in power that we're still here, we're still legion, and we're still everywhere, and we never forgive, we never forget. No justice! No peace! No justice! No peace! Since 2013, actually, we've been doing Million Mask Marches. It galvanizes everyone who thinks they associate with Anonymous all on one day. All streets! All streets! Sort of celebrate how much we've grown over the last year, meet other Anons. And if that's kind of cathartic, that's a pretty big thing for an Anon, because we don't get to meet each other very often. There's a lot going on here in Latin America. There's a lot of tension. There are people in the streets of Chile, Ecuador, Bolivia, Venezuela. They are marching against their government. And all of those protests in Latin America have at least the potential of overthrowing their, their government. So if the culture is generally speaking in a revolutionary mood, that's a really big sign that today could be good and even bigger than normal. I would not be at all even marginally surprised to see 2000 um, could be even bigger. Ha ha ha! Look at this, you! <laughs> <laughs> I'm, okay, come on, get him in the truck, get him in the truck, quick. We gotta get out of here, we gotta go. We'll talk on the way, let's go. God, dude, you look man. at you. You, get a ma you brought a mask, right? They took them off me at the airport. <laughs> they are illegal to bring them in? I, I don't know, but they took, I had four of them, they took them from me. Oh, we, better be, we have our wits about us, that's not good news, yeah. actually. That's concerning. Dude, how do I keep ending up at all these icons of revolution? Like, I literally live like a block away with a rooftop view of the fort where the entire Mexican revolution began. It's like a fucking shrine. And now, completely with no input of my own, here I am at the Monument de Revolution. I mean, come on, dude. a million mask march, anonymous million mask march, and anonymous has always supported Julian. So uh, all, all over the world, uh, Julian supporters decide to show up on this day, on November 5th, and wear a Julian mask instead of anonymous mask. Julian Assange exposed corruption of governments mundialmente, también expuso crimes de guerra de todo el mundo. También expuso las corrupciones que existen entre las corporaciones y por todo esto ha sido perseguido, ha sido... Respeto y admiración, respeto y admiración a Julián y no prisión. Respeto y admiración, respeto y admiración a Julián y no prisión. Okay, I gotta talk to my people. All right, guys, this is Commander X, live 
like a million mask march. You know, we're few right now, that's true, maybe by other standards of other million mask marches, but that can change in a heartbeat if you are somewhere in Mexico City right now and you happen to be listening to the stream, then, you know, get your shit down here. We're not going anywhere. And if you can't, then just get busy and start tweeting streams, other people's streams as well as my own. Make it go everywhere. Make everything go everywhere about Million Mask March. Let's really make ourselves known this year. Your life is completely used to this. Mine wasn't. So when we started to live our adventure, I was doing stuff that was completely foreign to me and was scary. And the crescendo was when you cut your way into, into Mexico. You know, I started out with a great idea and then it was sort of like flying at 100 miles an hour off a cliff in Juarez. I left Juarez thinking this was fucked up shit. I was screwed and I'm gonna end up living in a hut in the desert in fucking Mexico, eating cactuses for the rest of my life. Honest to God, I thought I had, so was completely fucked. There was a point in time where I gave up hope and quit even trying, and that's when I went and got Xander. Hey, look at you. Three months old. That was the moment when I was gonna just weave this mortal spear or mortal coil, as they say. This is Xander's first Christmas on planet Earth. Oh, look at the size of that fucking bone, buddy. I decided to give it one more fight with like literally the last bit of me left. It's a weird thing, and I, I mean, thank God it turned around, I guess, right? And I didn't cash out. I guess, really, you kind of got to thank my dog for that. <laughs> I mean, really, how weird is it the world might end up getting saved by a fucking dog? I'm here in Guanajuato now. You know, having spent a couple of years, almost exactly, here in Mexico. You know, I've moved around a lot. I've met people. I have generally try to build a network of friends to help uh, me. They're the same, right? Same size? Same. Is this grande or this? I like the color, too. I take that one. Yeah, yeah. And thus comes into play people like Vic. Well, I was just walking in the streets, and then I saw this American guy who was standing, all lost. He didn't know where to go. I just saw him like looking one way and the other. And he saw us, and, hey, guys, do you speak English? And I'm like, yeah. Hey, where can I go to a coffee shop? And I'm like, OK, let me, let me take you there, especially because of the streets here. So we started walking, and he started, we started talking. And then he kind of asked some questions to see if I kind of knew a little bit about well, anonymous, and I'm like, oh yeah, I'm familiar with it. And we talked a little bit more, and he said that he was one of the founders of Anonymous. And when I, whenever I get back home, I search online, I was like, oh, shit, it's, it's truly him. And I, was like, and I was like, damn, now I search him online. I mean, and I got all paranoid, right? So he sent me an email, and he was, oh, I slept in a, in a dumpster. It's my, my birthday. Like, it was the worst birthday of my life. So, well, I was like, what am I gonna do? Maybe you can stay there for a couple of months until things get, I don't know, good again. I mean, he became a really good friend, usually because kind of nobody likes him. <laughs> I like broken things. <laughs> Es como parte de, de nuestras vidas, entonces nos ocupamos de él, nos ocupamos como de lo que necesita. Cuando se acerca contigo, te tiene una hora platicando con él y contándote sus historias y 
creo que necesita a veces alguien como que lo escuche y que se ocupe de él, entonces me gusta hacer como esa parte. I'm broken. I needed to sell some books to make grocery money. There it is. Yes. All right. A herd of fucking stampeding turtles. We're off. Most of my friends were not actually aware of any of this. I was just the eccentric American who lives in Guanajuato. Nobody knew anything about me. And so I felt that it was incumbent upon me to let them know that, hey, actually, I got the secret. And I mean, I tried to put myself in their shoes for a moment and think, wow, if, what if I found out that Vic was like friggin' Batman? You know, that's the kind of level of revelation this is. You know, you got a really serious secret life here that nobody knew about. <laughs> Creo que estuvo bien lo que hizo en algún momento. Creo que fue algo importante y significativo para él y para otras personas. Pero creo que ahora él tiene como que hacer otro tipo de cosas, ¿no? Ocuparse de él mismo, de su perro, de su vida. Cosas que a lo mejor no tuvo tiempo de hacer después y ahorita podría. Porque necesita. My goal is to confront the Mexican government, surrender to their authority, and make my case for asylum because in this country I have the right to do so. As, as, a, as, a, as an underground, as a dissident, I've lived amongst you. And I've had a very normal life. I mean, I've been so fucking happy here. And that, that normalcy is just a taste of what I hope that I can have if the government of Mexico will do the right thing. They will let me stay here in this country, in your country. And if fate will allow me to remain in this city, that's what I want to do for the rest of my life. Is Commander X on the run for a good reason? Um, I, I honestly do not know if Commander X is on the run for any good reason. I, I don't know that he represents a serious threat to to law enforcement now. I mean, if you if you were to take the top 1,000 or 2,000 biggest threats to our cybersecurity in the United States. My guess is Commander X isn't anywhere near that list. I, I've done several cases up in um, San Francisco, and the person who was you know, pr prosecuting his case initially is the head of the unit now. And I, it's been a couple years, but I mean, the last time I talked to him, he's like, you know, say hey to Mr. Doyon, we, you know, we'll see him at some point, and, We'll get ourselves reacquainted. I would have no doubt that he would be a prize trophy on some U.S. attorney's wall. There is so much that is inexcusable that what happens to all of us, starting with that incident with the 40 U.S. raids by the FBI, 40 homes raided by armed FBI agents over a, a, a incident that slowed down a corporate website for a few seconds. There are a lot of people, especially a lot of media, who have said that, you know, those arrests really led to a, a, an end of Anonymous and a, a very much a slowdown of hacktivism. But what it more did was drive it a little more underground here in the U.S. and cause people to realize that they needed to uh, actually, you know, be anonymous a little better. I would remind any cognizant human being who considers himself a citizen of, an, of a democracy driven by informed consent when someone like me is targeted or someone else at Whistleblower is targeted. We are not the ultimate target. The public is the ultimate target. It wasn't to fuck with me. It was to prevent you from being able to act as a citizenry, which no one in this community, the intelligence community, the DOJ, the FBI, no one considers you and your informed consent to be a, to be a proper thing. If you don't understand that that's a subject matter here, you are not a citizen. You're part of the problem. You know, I, 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 I've heard all the arguments, uh, and, and I, I understand this is about freedom of information, et cetera. But the reality is that we're also dealing with something that could be very dangerous. For example, when the Russians, you know, use cyber to come after our election systems in 2016, did they cross a line? 
because that was a bold attack. We don't know the answer to that. And at some point, I think we need to have that dialogue about what are some of the rules of the game here when it comes to cyber. Because if we just sit back and say to hell with it, this is, we should let everybody do their own thing. At some point, we're gonna pay a hell of a price. Hopefully you guys can see uh, the stream okay. I'll turn it back around for me. Thank you for tuning in this morning. Hopefully, like I said, everything will turn out okay. I have my legal paperwork with me. But here I am, cameras in tow and everything, requesting political asylum and emergency refugee status. I've always known that this moment would come, but I also didn't want to fuck it up. So I wanted to make sure that the moment was perfect, and I believe that we're in that moment now. You know, it's the end of a long fucking run, 10 fucking years, and not at all sure that I would ever make it to this, to this moment. I bought these boots just for the journey. The day I left Toronto to come here to Mexico, I bought these boots. Those boots that travel 10,000 kilometers, 10,000 kilometers. You make the decision, then yeah, of course, you instantly accept the consequences. And the consequences of this decision is I would most likely never go home, except perhaps in a box. My goal originally was to keep fighting and not get caught. I'm still fighting and I'm not caught. And I'm this close to victory. And this time in a very permanent final way. You're not fucking gonna drag me back in chains. End of conversation. I'm gonna get fucking asylum. What trámite are you gonna do? What is the purpose of your visit? Uh, what trámite are you gonna do? What are you, what is the purpose of your visit? And now being 99% sure that we got our ducks in a row and the things are in place that need to be in place. And I will be, I believe shortly, surrendering myself to the authority and, and, and the sanctuary and the safety of the Mexican government. <sighs> I'm happy to report that today the government of Mexico did the right thing. Officials of the INM have accepted my petition material for political asylum and have granted me emergency refugee status. I am the first information activist in history to receive political asylum in a foreign country for protest actions taken under the flag of Anonymous. One of the reasons that I stuck with this process to the bitter end, despite my not really having to, was my fervent hope that I will not be the last. You know, the way he talks about it, it's almost like you're talking with a Vietnam veteran who's talking about his brothers in arms. I mean, he really feels it and, and gets emotional. The reality is, too, is that Anonymous and X, all these people, like, they've left a trail online. If you dig hard enough, you can find it. And Commander X will be remembered as one of these iconic figures, divisive figures, whether you believe them or not. Yeah, well, now that he's uh, almost Mexican, but not speaking Spanish, it's going to be very hard for him. Hi, how are you? Oh, you have English, thank you. Oh, yes, a little. Oh, you have more than I have Spanish. <laughs> one burrito, one latte. Okay. Perfecto, thank you so much. This is gonna be a lot of fun. Like, watching him, like, getting a job, being stable, having routine, like, work, I think it's gonna be even harder than getting the residency. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, look at this. Holy crap. I'm always sort of concerned for him and, and about him. But I sense there are, there are better days ahead for him. He's, he's now a bona fide, or he feels like a bona fide human being again. He has a piece of paper from a government with his picture on it. And even for a, a, an anarchist and a maverick and a rebel such as he, 
that seems to make him feel somewhat whole again. As for him and his, his activism there, uh, who knows? Vamos a saludar a mi amigo Pancho Villa. Que le vaya muy bonito. Hasta luego. No, like his personality is kind of like a big, a big fuck the system, a big I don't want to be part of this. So he's gonna find a way. He's you know, he's gonna find a way like to push the boundaries of the system, and I think that's cool. One last shot of this beautiful square here. It's a beautiful church, and this incredible historic square of San Miguel de Allende, the city where I won my freedom here in Mexico. Thank you guys. I'm gonna tune out now. Thank you guys for watching. And I'll see you all later tonight on Anonymous Fights Back. Look for that on Twitter. I'll be on. Expect me.